Greetings sailors and welcome back to World of Warships and a Patreon supporter replay. This is Pirit Skenya in the first of the French heavy cruisers, the Algerie. And it's not a bad ship overall, but if you've played the game long enough you might remember when this thing had a better rate of fire but no reload booster. And it was probably a better all-round ship at that point. These days it is a bit more situational because you can pump out that bit of extra damage with the reload booster which is useful on occasion but it's not that huge of a boost overall and you you have paid for that situational boost with overall DPM compared to what it used to be like but it's still it, it's reasonably fast it's got a reasonably good range it's got a reasonably good suite of consumables because you've got the uh, the speed boost as well and so it's a pretty nice tier 7 heavy cruiser as these things go it doesn't have amazing armor though most cruisers don't around these tiers and already he's taken a fairly nasty hit from what i'm pretty sure is the enemy Gascogne, because this is a, a mid-tier game for Pirate Skenny, he's in a, a, a tier 8 matchup, so it's not too bad, it could, it, it could definitely be worse. Facing tier 9s would be uh, rather nasty in this, but at least it's got the range to better handle it than some of the other tier 7 cruisers. So he's just plinking away, not doing huge amounts of damage so far, he's, he's landed a few hits. It is an unfortunate amount of hit points to have lost this early on, and I think that maybe makes him a bit more cautious but he's not withholding when there are targets to fire at although this Erland looks like yeah then they're, they're not gonna last the, the kid had considerably more health than they did one of the the things that this does do reasonably well with its its longer range is it, it and this goes for most cruisers with longer ranges is, is they're better at making themselves less attractive targets whereas something like that Alba for instance with its what 14 point something kilometers you've got to get a lot closer and therefore the big nasty ships that are in that case two tiers higher are going to be more interested in you because you know they have a better chance of hitting unless they're using dead eye in which case it really doesn't matter I suspect, by the way, the Monarch on the enemy team, that, that very much seems like a, an uncreative a dead eye user based on just how passive you'll see them play throughout this. Anyway, broadside Miyoko. Uh, he could have maybe switched to AP uh, with the uh, and, and used the reload booster here to uh, get some better effect there, but uh, chose to hang on to that. Uh, I think he probably could have, like, he was a bit sparing with his reload boosters in this one. He does use two of the four, but one of them is right at the end, as you'll see. So it's maybe a little underutilized overall, but I don't know if he would have done that much more damage. It maybe would have been a bit more damage if he'd gotten lucky and, say, scored some Citadel hits on that Miyoko. But I'm pretty sure he does then... Well, we'll come back to that Miyoko. I'm pretty sure he's the one that gets the remainder of that Miyoko's health anyway, so maybe it wouldn't have made that much difference, but still, it's, it's a thing you, you could have done. Now, he's, he's come over to this flank, as you can see, because uh, this team is really scattered. There's not really a good place for him to push or support, and so I think he's chosen to come over here because he's got a bit more... Island cover to work with in terms of these two islands. I mean, the, the Scorner is spotting those battleships there. So there's a chance you can farm these battleships for a bit of damage. Maybe this Miyoko as well if they uh, if they push out. In fact, now he's switching to AP. But uh, in terms of overall control, I mean, the enemy team have very firmly got the inner two caps and they are only basically just about keeping the, uh, the outer cap blocked with what? two ships three ships at the moment so it's not great it really isn't the enemy team has accumulated a really big chunk of uh, victory points at this stage and if the enemy team don't start dying 
fairly rapidly, then this is on track for, a, for an early win for the enemy team. So it, it's kind of in the enemy team's court, as it were. This is theirs to lose at this stage. They're going to have to start getting sloppy and aggressive and, you know, pushing out individually into silly situations and well you can kind of guess that that is in fact what they start doing so the kid overextended and actually got taken out by the fubuki with i presume somebody else's assistance this cracciolo is also a little extended i mean they are fairly near allies but all the rest of their allies are behind an island and so they are a, a prime target for both the uh, Scorner and for Piritskeni at the moment. I don't know if the Richelieu here has shots, but they will do soon if they don't already. The Scorner is definitely playing a risky game opening up when they're in that position, though. There we go. There's that Miyoko. And oh, here we go. Another broadside. AP shells. Let's see if we can get some better traction this time. They're not amazing, these AP shells, but, you know, it's still... 8 inch AP. It's not anything like the heavy AP of the Americans, but it will still work if you're not angling. So that is one less Miyoko. The enemy team still dancing around 800 points, but they're now starting to lose ships. And in fact, they're even now losing the middle ring. I think a big part of it is this 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 chunk, this concentration of firepower that they had to the, the south of this position hasn't really done anything. And you've had odd ships here and there splitting off and getting picked apart. And clearly other ships have been, you know, putting in some damage towards them as well. But they, they haven't used this concentration of firepower to their advantage. And because Piritskenia's team hasn't particularly blundered into what would be a very unfavorable situation, uh, it, it's actually, aside from the points, starting to turn in this team's favor. But it's definitely a little early to conclusively call this either way. It's just this should be a good position with this lead for the enemy team and instead they are really just letting it slip away from them and Piritskenia just has to do his best to take advantage of this. Now the Caracciolo look like they might have a pop at him before this time they're definitely having a pop at him and uh, this could be nasty but the a SAP really doesn't do a lot fortunately so, uh, yeah, uh, Piritskeni kind of gets away with that, and he's also in a position where he can at least keep his back turrets firing here as well. Another fire would be ideal, but uh, really just any damage he can do would be awfully nice. And well, there we go, it's actually the Richelieu get that gets the kill. So we're now capping the middle. The enemy team are severely depleted. They're down to their battleships and the tier 6 carrier. Piriskin has actually managed not to take too much more damage, but they are still quite comfortably ahead on points. But because these last players left are among the most passive of the enemy players, including that monarch that I pointed out earlier, it's really not going very well for them at all. But the fact that they have all these battleships left, and some of them quite healthy as well, if they suddenly stepped up their game, they might be able to do something here. All that's left of this team is that, that Richelieu on Colorado in terms of the heavy armor and the heavy firepower. And otherwise it's uh, two cruisers and two destroyers. But the destroyers alone gives them a reasonable advantage. Especially as the enemy carrier doesn't seem to be particularly focusing on them. In fact, we've got them trying to drop on Pirate Scania. Uh, I, I suppose he's a kind of reasonably lone target at the moment, but this is the kind of situation 
where yes the destroyers are the absolute logical thing to go for but it also really sucks when you're the destroyer in this kind of scenario and the carrier does focus on you and then it just makes the rest of the game completely miserable even if it is kind of the the tactically correct thing to do now the Gascony, the Gascony, Gascoigne, <laughs> that's the extremely British way of saying it, the Gascony. The Gascoigne looks like maybe they are trying to go for a ram on the Richelieu. It's not entirely clear. Uh, somebody is, uh, and there we go, they actually take an opportunistic pop at... Uh, at uh, Piritskenia, and other people have been firing at him as well, but it's Piritskenia that's going to get the kill, so the uh, the Rishlu gets to survive. There's also a very temptingly low health Amagi over there, but that's a little bit further away. Much closer is this Monarch, who I think has been firing HE the entire game. I think it's one of those Monarchs. And this is one of the irksome things about the British battleship line in general, is that for most of it, it teaches you, hey, use the HE, it's got really high utility. Although, for most people, it's then, you know, I'm, I'm going to use HE because it's the brain-dead choice kind of thing, rather than having to think about the ammo that I use in any, any given situation. But then you get to, well, first the Queen Elizabeth and then the Monarch with, with the 15-inch guns that do not fit that high explosive mould at all and the uh, the premiums with 15 inch guns are exactly the same Vanguard and Hood. So you see people playing the Monarch with the HE and it's really no better than somebody playing Turpits with HE for example. Uh, except I think the HE shells still have a bit more penetration but that doesn't really make that much difference in terms of battleship calibers for the most part. I mean if it's something like, you know, Nelson's HE or Conqueror's HE or Thunderer's HE where it's got super high pen and you're in a, a, a cruiser then, yes, okay, that can be very nasty, but uh, for the Monarch 15-inch guns, it's, it's it's less of a thing compared to, you know, German 15-inch HE. 15 -inch HE. It's, it's not that important because the calibre isn't that big. So it's taken a bit more damage though. I think that was from the Amagi. The Monarch's just been like, what is this? If there was a battleship over here, I mean, they've just been flat angled against the north side of the map for quite a lot of this. Reversing, uh, yeah, that that's somebody that's going to be rolling around on a Conqueror someday. <laughs> Probably someday fairly soon, there's a thought. So although the enemy team have still managed to get kills, and indeed the Richelieu has just died, uh, they are now within a whisker of losing this. I mean, that Amagi has managed to rack up a tally of... Or is it the Bismarck that's got four kills? I'm not actually sure. One of them has four kills. They've, they've actually managed to step up their game towards the end, but it's not been matched by their teammates. So, although this is looking a bit hairy, it's three per team. And Piritskenia does have to be careful as he is in a relatively squashy cruiser. I mean, he's just been doing the sensible thing, grabbing the caps. But he's also been working his way towards that Amagi. And he's got enough island cover here that uh, he can take pot shots at both of them. Although the Amagi is the prime target. The enemy team's now at over 900 points. Despite everything, the enemy team could still win this. And indeed, the Colorado looks like they are in really quite dire straits. So despite it all, despite the passive gameplay of a crucial number of enemy players uh, and having accumulated such a lead of uh, victory points, uh, yeah, it, it's still not quite going to be enough. Which is a bit of a spoiler for the ending, but I wouldn't be really, really be showing this if it was a complete crushing loss. Although sometimes it's interesting to show interesting losses, but uh, it, there tends to be, I don't know, if, it, if it's an enjoyable loss, I suppose, but it, it, you know, it, enjoyment for me more tends to come from <laughs> winning than anything else. Anyway, so he's taking some pot shots at the Bismarck, which is super risky, but I think he's just trying to go to the Amagi to reveal themselves. 
to take those shots, even though they shouldn't. Even though they absolutely should just have not taken the bait. And that's going to get them killed. He's also now close enough to pick up this ranger who has had opportunities to move away. I mean, ranger's not a slow aircraft carrier, but uh, it's, it's not, not an opportunity that they've really taken. And so they are now in the lead on points. And this is the point where I, I, I really got baffled because instead of trying to kill the thing that's trying to kill their aircraft carrier, which, you know, is going to be the thing that, that absolutely tips this over to, a, to being a win potentially, uh, the enemy Bismarck tries to go for the friendly ranger, but... Uh, yeah, they're not going to get them in time, and they, they've just managed to somehow <laughs> squeak this one out. And I think it really does come down to the enemy team giving it away. But we absolutely have to give credit to Piritskenya there as well for doing all the right things in a cruiser, using island cover as appropriate. Um, like I said earlier on, maybe could have used the reload booster a lot more. They waited till the very nearly, you know, last second to uh, use the reload booster on that ranger. And there we go, it was the Amagi, and in fact the Amagi got a, a cracking out of that, so yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it just, there was too much complacency at play on the enemy team, and and uh, uh, Pirit Skenny was really able to play around that, use that to his advantage. And although he wasn't the only one that, you know, did some damage there, uh, by that plus, you know, 2000 base XP score, uh, I think it's fair to say he was probably one of the more valuable players on that team. I mean, the, the Richelieu did all right as well. In fact, the Fubuki managed third place, Skorna in fourth place, Alba in fifth place. <laughs> so the Alba managed to beat uh, quite a lot of the tier eights in this game, which is a little bit sad. But um, yeah, no, I, I think that that's a, a pretty good demonstration overall of, of uh, how to kiting cruiser, I suppose. So that's it for this replay, just about. Uh, before I do wrap this up, I will point out that, as I said, this was a Patreon supporter spotlight. Uh, Patreon is what pays the bills, really, and uh, I, I could absolutely use your support at the moment. Uh, <laughs> things have dipped a bit over the past year. Um, I mean, my own, like, not amazing mental health certainly hasn't helped in terms of video output and therefore ad revenue and uh, I did have a kind of a plan to be more regular on Twitch and then yeah <laughs> no I don't think I've streamed since like February so yeah it's one of those things where I'm like yeah I should I should do that but then sitting down and actually doing it and wanting to sit and interact with people for two three four hours it's like mm. I'd rather just curl up in bed <laughs> kind of thing so yay mental health stuff it's always fun but you know I've got Sam to to cuddle up to me I suppose so things could be worse but anyway what was I saying oh yes so basically um, Patreon is what pays the bills and I would think you're super amazing if you wanted to even chip in a few bucks or something at the moment and like I say there's the supporter replay tier as well and I think there's even some spaces for the top tier which, which uh, is the the tier where you get to play with me in warships or whatever else for like an hour a week so uh, yeah do go check it out plus <laughs> so that's it uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this replay and if you have you can do all the usual things down underneath the video and of course as always stay tuned for more